Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 7, 2014. This is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week you're going to see I have a plethora of stuff to cover. So I'm going to go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Make us a Mountain Dew. Do not compensate me for this endorsement. Pepsi Go, hey, give me a shout out. I guess I better quit begging for that endorsement. Red Bull saw is too fat. People say, did they really say that? I was like, they did. <laughs> They're looking for athletes. You have to jump off a mountain, dive like 300 feet into the water. Or... Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Enough of that nonsense. Hey, there's a disclaimer screen. You could lose money trading or, as I like to put it, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I stole that line from Greg Morris. I no longer give him credit, though. I make it in my own. <laughs> hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. You read the book? You like the book? That's a layman's guide to trading. Uh, do me a favor. Put me up a good review on Amazon.com. If you didn't like it, then I'm not sure why you'd be here, unless you're a sadist or something. Um Speaking of which, the reason I beg for a review, in case you're wondering why, other than for ego purposes, obviously, is um, there's some malignant people out there who review the reviews and don't even read the book, which is the stupidest thing in stupid town. I can't imagine having that much uh, time. Somebody says the sound is muting, muted. Um, well, what happens is, let me just adjust my mic. What happens is there's a lot of stuff between me and you, and uh, sometimes a squirrel will get his nuts caught in a wire or something. Um, so that's uh, that's probably what's going on. But uh, if more of you are, if, do tell me if you're missing sound. If a dozen of you are missing sound, then I know it's a big deal. The good news is it's robust on this end. Uh, thank you, Michael. Sounds okay. Uh, so what happens is the recording will, will pick it up. So if you miss anything, we do record these. Uh, what are we going to talk about? Well, I definitely want to talk about current conditions. and. And that's, uh, that's vitally important given the nature of the market right now. So we're going to spend some time in the slides talking about that. I do want to talk about major versus minor bow tie signals. And just bear with me on that for you people who, who know me and know the signals and understand what I'm saying. There's some new people in here that I think can really benefit from this knowledge. Um, I also want to have, also have a dead money report, finally. And then... Uh, I want to talk some more about the last bull market and IPOs because we saw we saw things kind of come to almost a screeching halt, and then it's like they picked up again a little bit, and that's kind of interesting. And I think I'm going to go ahead and schedule either today or tomorrow. I'm going to schedule a, um, a follow-up webinar on the IPOs. So for those of you who are here, I see a few faces that are here that were at the webinar. I'm going to follow up on that, and uh, that will make a lot more sense when we get to it. And anything you want me to cover, let me know. And uh, if time allows in the slides, we'll work it in. In worst case, it'll be fodder for next week. Uh, hold off on your individual stock questions for now. And when we get to the charts, we should have enough time to uh, to get to them all. So uh, just and then the other thing too, if you want to ask about three or four or five different stocks, just ask about the stock. Uh, ask about the stock. Hit carriage return. Ask about the next stock, hit carriage return, and so on and so forth. That way I can delete your question on each one, and I'll make sure that I get to all the stocks that you're interested in. All right, uh, we hadn't had a dead money report in a while because we hadn't really made much money in a while. As you know, we hit a bit of a drawdown, and we talked about that last week, a week before. And uh, what's interesting about the dead money thing is, is I guess human nature never changes. And there's like three or four or maybe a dozen total, but three or four questions that seem to stick out in my mind that I get over and over and over again. One of them is, do you trade through earnings? And the answer is yes. And the other one is dead money. And people complain about dead money. And sometimes I'll recommend a stock. And it just dies and goes sideways. It doesn't stop out, but it doesn't do anything fantastic. And I've showed countless examples in the past. And we got two more this week. But uh, one of my favorite ones which I should have thrown in here, but it's a stock that triggered and just went sideways. Didn't do anything wrong, just went sideways. And it never really went underwater by much, meaning it wasn't losing much. It just went sideways. And it was seen as dead money, and most of my clients bailed out. Well, within about seven or eight weeks, the stock got bought out, and it doubled overnight. So that's the kind of move you can miss by 
not sticking with the so-called dead money. Now, to those of you who are new to the term, definition of dead money from Investopedia.com says, a slang term for money invested in security with minor hopes of appreciation or earning a return. Here's the problem with dead money. If you knew the stock would never work out, then by all means, get out of the stock. But you don't know. And I spent a lot of time on this in the past. I don't want to spend too much time this week because we have too much to cover. But go in and watch the archives of these shows, and you'll see that uh, for a while we were doing dead money reports almost every week. And the thing is, if you knew for a fact that the position would never work, then get out. But nobody knows for a fact. Nobody has that crystal ball knowing when that trend is going to end or if that trend is not going to resume, I should say. So there's no way of knowing. And my belief is that you get in, you get your timing as perfect as possible. You look for perfection. As I often say, this is now, okay? Oops, let's, let's try to get that a little. This is now, this is the past, and this is the future. And if you're looking at a chart right here, okay, right now, you want to make sure you have as much perfection as possible. You want to try to make sure you get that timing exactly right. But once you enter that trade, then what you need to do is forget about it. And like I wrote in this morning's column and newsletter, is let that market be the final arbiter. Let that stop stop you out or let that stop keep you in that position. So if the position, you get your timing a little wrong, it doesn't work out right away, just stick with it. So what? You're not losing money by tying up that capital, um, at least from my standpoint, especially nowadays where what are you going to get on your money? 1% return if you're lucky? So I don't see it as dead money. I mean, if we were... Back in the days, uh, geez, I remember when the, uh, what was that bond? The bond was like an 8% bond, but it was like 9 and 10, 11%. It's like, it's like, oh, okay, I could trade or I could make 11% just sitting on my money. It's like, I don't know. That's a, that's a kind of a tough decision because when you trade, you could actually lose money. Uh, but nowadays, it's kind of a no-brainer, and I don't worry too much about interest rates or anything like that. My job is to speculate. Anyway, I believe it's sticky with the position until proven wrong. And here's the thing. The methodology relies partially on outliers. And an outlier is, a, is a, an exaggerated move in something, a four or 500% move in something. And uh, they call them outliers, statistical term. I guess it was, it'd be somewhere way out. You got the tail and be somewhere way out here in a tail. Uh, much bigger than anything the statistics would suggest. And that's our goal is to end up with that little biotech company, little solar company, or even a burrito maker that turns into the biggest, the biggest winner in Wintertown, just goes up forever. And if you miss a couple of those outliers, you're not going to do as well as if you catch a couple of them. And I, I, another way of putting it is all you need is one or two of those a year and it could have a material impact on your portfolio. You could have a pretty good year and just catch a few big winners or even a lot of mediocre winners, and that's all you need, okay? Uh, Michael says, 1980 money market was 15 plus. Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, I wasn't trading back then, but I remember some ridiculous uh, interest rates uh, in the early 80s. And I remember thinking, like, uh, when Bush 1 got elected, somebody before the election was asking me, I'll just get in the markets then. Um, or then, I forget, what year was Bush 1? I, I forget. But um, I don't know if I've been trading for a while or what, but somebody knew that I was in the markets, and I said, it doesn't matter who goes in because they're going to look like a genius because the Fed had been cutting rates. And back then, that was a big deal. Back then, when rates were at double digits and you start cutting them, that's like the mother of all bull markets uh, coming in. I think it was uh, – Clinton beat him out or whatever? Um, I forget. Anyway, uh, I digress. But, yeah, back then the rates were ridiculous, and, and once they start coming down, the market just took off. Okay, um, here's a dead money report. We got two this week. And, then this actually triggered twice. This triggered back here, and it kind of nicked the stop. Um as far as I'm concerned, that's a position that should have been stayed with. Uh, I personally stayed with a position through that nick, and I do still own some of this stock, just uh, 
full disclosure. Now, what happens is we came in with a second entry here, but that's not the reason I'm saying it. The reason I'm saying is that's what's in the mechanical portfolio, which I'll show you in just a few minutes. Now, this thing triggered, ran up a little bit, came back in, and then what happened? It just meandered, but it never really did anything bad. Okay, your entry's right here. You'd have a loss that much. You made a little, lost a little, made a little, lost a little. But if you're watching every little tick in here, and it took 43 days. It's like, well, Dave, that's dead money. Why would you stick with that? Well, it hasn't done anything wrong. You got a nice liberal stop in here. Just forget about it. And the conditions aren't so great right now where you need the capital. If conditions are fantastic, because somebody was, was asking me earlier, uh, again, this is what, what prompted the dead money report. Somebody was asking me earlier in the week, it's like, well, you know, could that capital be put to, put to work elsewhere? Well, if you can't find a setup to save your life, we went through July. I don't think we had one setup in the entire month of July trigger. Um, that used to really stress me out, okay? And it aggravates me a little bit because I know that people, uh, human nature is human nature. I know that I probably lost some clients because of that, because I didn't recommend something, because I didn't throw out something for a little action or whatever. But that's fine with me. I don't care. Um, I just, I'm just i going to take the high road and do what I think needs to be done. So from where I sit, there's not a whole lot else to do but sit on those positions that aren't necessarily working at the time and let the stop take you out. Now, like this gentleman said, he said, well, what if there's, so, what if there's like something greater out there? Well, right now, we don't have a whole lot of positions on, so you've got plenty enough room to take that something greater. But let's say that the whole market starts taking off. Well, a couple of things will happen. One, your dead money position will take off, okay? Or two, you'll get into some new positions that start taking off, and then you start taking profits, and then you're creating more and more wealth. And then those positions will go up in value. And if you have to go into or into margin, you're going to have more and more money on your account to margin it up if you have to to get to that new position. Now, I don't want to digress too far into margin, but if things are fantastic, and let's say you got 10 positions on, and you go to take that 11th, but you're out of money, okay? Well, what could happen is, I think my pen came out, okay. What could happen is you could say, okay, well, I'm going to go on the margin just for a little while, and if things are really that great, you put that 11 position on, then these start hitting profit targets, okay. So then effectively you end up with half the amount of positions as they all hit the top profit target, and even though you have 10 total. We've discussed this quite a bit. So you use this margin as a transition, but don't stress over dead money because the market doesn't always move on your time frame and as long as it doesn't do anything wrong by stopping you out there's no need to get excited and to quit your position okay now let's take a look at another one. Oh, by the way so it took 43 days but in 43 days you ended up making almost 20 percent and if you annualize that that's over a hundred percent annualized okay so that's a pretty good move. So like I said earlier, you catch a few outliers, that 3 and 4 and 500% move, and you, um, that Mountain Dew sneaking up on me, and you have a pretty good year. Well, even if you don't catch those few outliers, if you catch several moves like this where they can be annualized out, okay, then you'll do fine also. you also do uh, pretty darn good. Now let's take a look at the other one. That was on the long side. And what's kind of cool is the way it shapes up because one was on the long side, one was on the short side. So over the last couple of months while we held these positions, you could have made a case for exiting the short and you could have made a good case for exiting the long. There's always, you could always make a case for something. But instead of trying to sit around and make a case for something and say, oh, market's rolling over, I better just get out of all my longs and try to outsmart the market. Instead of doing that, what you do is let the market take you out of your positions. Let the market make that decision for you. Those of you who have been coming to um, those of you who been uh, coming to this show for a while know that I often talk about the pressures off, and the pressures off. There's always going to be a lot of stress in trading. That's that's a given. 
just because you decided to start trading doesn't mean you no longer have a pulse. I get excited. I drop f bombs. Okay, um, I probably get more excited than I should. Okay, do as I say, not as I do. Right, but by letting the stop take you out. I mean, I still go, oh, man, this is going to give me, uh, going, going against me. I'm like, you know what, Dave? You're not stopped out. Don't worry about it unless you get stopped out. And if you get stopped out, you still don't have to worry about it because it took you out of your position. And then you, then your mentality is next, okay? So it's like I do get pissed off when a position goes against me, but I don't get so pissed off when it stops me out. It's like it stops me out. I'm like, the hell would you? You know, I could care less. You, you don't want to be in my portfolio? That's fine, okay? Go away, <laughs> okay? Jonathan says, not sure how anyone can annualize anything in this business. I'm not sure what you mean about that, Jonathan. If you're making 16% over a short period of time, and uh, short period of time, it's not even a short period of time, 37 days like, like this uh, RAD, okay? If you did that every, if you made 16%, Every 37 days, that's 109 percent annualized. Okay. Now, if you're once your equity curve, uh, we talked about equity curves lately, like we went to a little bit of a drawdown. But once you start coming out of the drawdown, if you start making these, uh, let's just say 20 percent round numbers over a short period of time, then that gives you more money to go back in, and then more money to go back in. So you got 20 percent more money on that position to go back in. So you're putting on bigger and bigger and bigger positions, and if that could, those conditions improve, you're going to compound out. It's not only is it annualized, but it's going to start compounding out. Okay? Do you annualize the losses? Um, I guess you could. I don't know. Well, the point is, the point is that by sticking with a position. And letting it work. If it does work, it's worth it. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why you would annualize the losses. You you cut your losses. Okay. Um, you let the winners ride. Okay. Now these are still two open positions. Okay. So my point is that if all you got was that 16 percent, then you got 109 percent annualized. But these are going to stay open as long as until what? Until they get stopped out. And where's the stop now? The stop's at break even. Okay. Now, this is what they look like in the portfolio. Portfolio has been kind of ugly up until now. Um, fortunately, we got stopped out of uh, some stinkers. And then now we got some um, potential winners in the works. But you can see that this is what happens. Uh, this is Zen in here. Hit the initial profit target. And this is the RAD which hit the initial profit target right here. This is based on a 2% risk and a hypothetical for educational purposes um, and other disclaimers apply. 2% on 100K, again, hypothetical portfolio, which means you risk 2% of the account, which comes to $2,000 per trade. You divide that $2,000 by your point risk here, and then that gives you the number of shares that will be trading. I divide those in two. And we have the trading loaf, which we just took profits on, on these two. And then you have the trending loaf, which hopefully you can let ride for a long, long time. Okay. Any questions on dead money um, or sticking with positions? Trust me, your life's going to get a lot easier. Stop trying to figure out everything. Stop trying to outsmart the markets, Okay. You start seeing the market kind of roll over a little bit. Oh, you know what? I'm bailing out of all my longs. Some guy was on TV the other day. I'm bailing out of everything. Okay? I didn't see him, but somebody told me he was on TV. And then the market went up about 10% after his little statement. So it's like stupid. Okay? And what if, what if I'd, be, I'd be willing to bet if he had good little trend-following skills. I don't even know the guy's name. But if he had good little trend-following skills, I'd be willing to bet that some of those stocks in his portfolio probably really took off if the overall market went up 10%. Okay. Now, let me just rehash trend transitions real quick. And I know some of you guys' eyes are going to glaze over a little bit. But for the new folks, 
Um, when you have a transitional pattern, such as a bow tie or a first thrust, and it's coming off of a market that's making all-time highs, okay, now this is a dated chart, but it's still relevant. This is an S&P weekly chart, okay? When it's coming off of all-time highs, the most amount of people are going to be on the wrong side of the market, okay? They're going to be holding on longer term, and they're going to be on the wrong side of the market. So when that market begins to turn, if the slide begins to resume, it's going to be exacerbated, is that a word, by the amount of people that are on the wrong side of the market, okay? Now, when you have a market making major lows, okay, ideally all-time lows are all-time highs. Well, hopefully we never see all-time lows again in the market, God forbid. But we can see 10 and 15 and 5 and 10 year lows in the market. So those could be fairly major sell signals too. But the, the bigger the low or the lower the low or the higher the high, the bigger the possible transition is into works because the most pe amount of people, again, are on the wrong side of the market. We had a major buy back in 2003. This bottom took two years to form, and then we got a buy in 2003. But then you can see we had a pretty nice run. Then we had a major bow tie sell signal win end of 2007, believe it or not, on a weekly chart, okay? And then what happened in 2008, the market imploded, okay? Now this buy took a while to form because what happened was we had a spike bottom and then the market went straight back up. There were plenty of other signals in here, especially on the daily charts. It turned much quicker than the daily. By the way, it's going to turn in a lower time frame. People ask me about time frames all the time, and, and I was going to cover it today, but just, there's just not enough time, no pun intended. And we had a weekly, I'm sorry, we had a hourly bow tie down. I'll show you that in the spiders uh, a few weeks back, and that's kind of cool to look at. you got to be careful, though, with those intraday signals because you, you, you might not see the forest for the trees. But if you get an hourly bow tie off an all-time high in the market, I don't care what the market is. You might want to pay attention to that signal. And that's your write that down moment. I just paid for your webinar, okay? Now, the point I'm trying to make is when a market's making a major low or a major high, and you get a transitional pattern like it has in these particular cases here, okay, those are major signals. Now, sometimes in between, you might get a rollover or it might roll back up, okay? Those are what I call minor signals. I don't trade the minor signals. I, I see a lot of bloggers out there. Occasionally, they even give me credit for the bow tie, but uh, that's okay. Next time I discover a pattern, I'm slapping my name on it, like um, some of my smarter brethren in this business, like Mr. Bollinger. <laughs> that was brilliant, John. Good job. Um, anyway, DeMarc, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I would call Big Day's Bow Ties. Yeah, that's what I would call them from now on. Hey, you know what? That's going to stick. Big Day's Bow Ties. That's the new name. From now on, they're not going to be a bow tie. They're going to be Big Day's Bow Ties. There you go. All right. Anyway, so your minor signals occur within the realm of the major highs and the major lows, and they're not quite as powerful, but they can work on occasion. Now, Big Day's Bow Ties. Yep. That's it. BDBs. No, see, if you call them BDB, then nobody's gonna. Then my name's no longer. My name gets taken out again. Now let's take a look at the Russell. And there's a couple things to know about transitional patterns. And one of the most powerful things is sometimes you get like a double bottom in the market, and then you get like a bow tie or that cup and handle or that first thrust or whatever, and then. It really takes off. It's like the first time just kind of fakes everybody else, uh, everybody out, and then the second time it really takes off. Well, at high, sometimes you get a market to make a new high, it'll make a bow tie down, and it doesn't really materialize, and then the market goes on to make a new high. Usually that second signal can be a powerful signal. In this case, it was kind of sloppy. You did have kind of a first thrust type of setup, and I suppose your bow tie would have triggered here. And in this particular case, bow tie would trigger here. Let's just say bow tie here. And this was about a 4% move, and this was about a 4% move. Now, this is what's concerning. You've got these three peaks in here, and then these two are double tops. 
Sometimes that second signal, in this case is the third signal, is the real deal. Notice you have a bow tie down, you have a first thrust kind of hidden in there. If you look carefully, this market dropped, and then it pulled back a little bit. There's your first thrust. By the way, always look for first thrust first, okay? And then look for bow ties, because as you can see, that first thrust is going to happen sometimes before the bow tie, or usually before the bow tie, unless you get a market that does a very gradual rollover, and you're not really noticing the rollover until you put those moving averages in, okay? But anyway, I digress. You had the bow tie. It's triggered in here, and it's dropped about 4%, sort of like these other moves in here, 3 or 4%. What's concerning is, could this be the real deal? And it might just be. And this is a Russell 2000, or as I call it, the Rusty. Okay. So we need to keep an eye on this situation. And I suppose down here around 108 is going to be our support levels. Okay. Now, I left this slide in from last week because I, I was talking about this. Uh, I was kind of hinting at this all week in my column. And... What has happened in the market, and I've shown this quite a bit since 2009, you've had some pretty serious spills where the market just looks look like that. You have bow ties, you'll have rollovers, you'll have all kinds of signals suggested that uh, the market is tanking, okay? And then it's going back up. So it's done that quite a few times. And then right now, it's starting to do it again, okay? And with Judd Dotary over at Stadium Capital Management, I always want to say stadium, said, active management has underperformed since the lows of 2009, but this is to be expected. Anyone who has kept pace with the market the last few years should be questioned because they likely have not made any moves, many moves, and then I'm going to fix this, okay? Any moves that would or will protect the portfolio when the next inevitable bear market occurs. So right here, you're getting stopped out. Right here, you might be putting on some shorts. Right here, same thing. Right here, same thing. Okay, That has not really paid off that well over the last few years. But you've got to do the right thing. You've got to do what you have to do when you have to do it. And that's a secret of markets. And by the way, to give uh, my buddy Greg a, a shout out, that's from his book, Investing with the Trend. I recommend you read it. It's um it's a little knowing Greg he's real he's real um simple when it comes to the markets but the, the book is uh the book is pretty involved uh but it's it's a good book and there's a lot of good a lot of gems in the book at least on the first reading and I think on the second or third reading there's gonna be a lot more now any questions about anything we covered so far about three weeks ago I did a uh, webinar on IPOs. And the reason I haven't done a follow-up, we're going to have four follow-up webinars on that one webinar. And the reason I haven't done a follow-up just yet is because it seems like the day I did the webinar, which was my biggest fear, would be like the top of the IPO market. And since then, the, on that day that I did the webinar, I picked some IPOs. And most of them have not worked. Most of them, have, in fact, have failed miserably since then. But I have not given up on the IPO market. I don't think it's the last IPO market. Like I said last week, I think the brakes have been tapped. Now, as I said, also said last week, I pointed out there was a bubble in IPOs. I meant that as a positive because bubbles can go a lot further and last a lot longer than most people are willing to believe. You go back to 99, I don't know if anybody remembers that. If you do... Um, God, it was wonderful. I just want to reminisce and, and just, oh, it was fantastic. It was, it was amazing. And that bubble went longer and longer and longer, and there were a lot of people that just were in disbelief. And as long, it's, it's almost like as long as people fight the bubble, it'll keep going. And uh, I remember when, I'm not, I don't want to pick on the system, but there was a famous system that wasn't working anymore because – the there were no there were no earnings in a system required earnings okay you, you could probably think a little bit and figure out what system that is and and they actually changed their dynamic they actually changed their system to fit the market well I tell you when you see something like that happen and by the way I don't want to digress too far 
But when you see somebody following a major popular system like that, and then all of a sudden they change the way the system works to fit the market, you know that you're coming in on the top of the market. They, they basically ripped out a piece of their fundamental aspects, or they changed the fundamental aspect to make it fit the market. You know that market, that, that uh, bull market is coming to an end. Anyway. Bubbles go much further and last much longer than people are willing to admit. Yeah, Howard's saying, did I put the jinx in the IPO market? I might have, okay? No, I don't want to believe that that, that that actually could happen. But I'll tell you this. I've been watching and trading this bubble in IPOs. In fact, if you go back and look at the stock selection webinar, which we did back in December, and that's what's got me really on fire about the IPOs, was that's when I really recognized what an incredible bull market we were in these IPOs, and if you look at a couple of stocks that were picked in that webinar, you just go to go to my website, and click on the stock selection webinar, you'll see the stocks that we picked in that webinar, and some of them just absolutely took off, and, and most of those ones that really took off were IPOs. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something on IPOs because I've been doing research for IPOs on IPOs for years, and I think I'm gonna let go of a little bit of that research, and. I was thinking, it's like, well, this is such a great bull market. Maybe I better wait a while, wait a while, wait a while, thinking that that bull market would end. Well, <laughs> finally, I said, you know, I'm just going to do it because even if it does end, this information is good. This information is useful because there will be bull markets in the future. And there will also be some individual stocks in the IPOs that will still take off. So one thing I've observed is the number of die and dies – is increasing like the stock dies and then it continues to die I'll show you that in a minute but the beauty is there's no triggers on all those and there are fewer big winners but here's the other thing that's pretty good too is that you just need a few big winners in order to do well and the euphoria has not completely died we just had a crazy chicken company come out it's called loco chicken we'll look at that one in one second and it actually doubled over a few days so it's not completely dead yet. It's kind of like, uh, you know, bring out your dead. You know, I'm not dead yet, you know. But when will you be back next Tuesday? You know, it's like, oh, he'll be, he'll be stinking by then, you know. Anyway, I digress. Uh, Monty Python fans might uh, get a kick out of that. But the die and die pattern, we talked about this in, in the webinar, is where a stock comes out and it just dies and then it just continues to die. And we explain that, or I explain that, what happens is the reality sets in fast and it fails to materialize. It's, it's a rotten fish to begin with. When we talked about our little sardines, in case you're wondering why the sardine is in the chart, we talked about the old story of trading sardines where the sardines were made to trade and not eat. And then the last guy holding the bag who bought the last of the most expensive sardines opens them up and realizes they're rotten. Okay? We don't care what we're trading. I mean, to some extent, we want to know what sector and to some extent, we want to know if there is a story in an IPO, okay, is it a biotech, is it an energy stock, uh, alternate energy stock or something, something that might cure some problem, including uh, maybe good burritos, okay, but it doesn't have to be rocket science. It could be good yoga clothes, it could be good burritos, okay, but sometimes they smell a rat from the beginning, okay, or they smell a dead fish from the beginning, and the price just comes out and it drops, okay. And then your reality just shoots through the roof, and it gets even worse, drops, accelerates. And then the enthusiasm is at its absolute highest right before it comes out, okay? So that's what happens with those stocks, okay? Now, there have been an increasing number of dies lately, okay, a die and dies. And I just threw one up here to show you. Here's the beauty of this, okay? We have two or three little breakout patterns that we're following, and we got a couple of trend resumption patterns, and we even have a deep retracement pattern that we're looking for in trading these IPOs. Well, guess what? This stock hasn't broken out. This stock hasn't rallied, okay? This stock hasn't done anything that would cause a setup other than it died. And so what? So if they die, if, the, if you get an increasing amount of stocks that just come out and die, then what do we do? We just avoid them, okay? So what? Bide your time. Be patient, okay? Let them go. Like the Disney song, let it go. 
Okay. Now, one thing I was kind of thinking about, and I've I've observed this over the years. Sometimes when the stock market begins to flatten out, what I'll notice is you'll have a spike in IPOs. Obviously, if the stock market is doing well, okay, everything works at a bull market, by the way, in case you're wondering, okay, everything works, okay. Well, I'll come back to that, John. And obviously, IPOs work, too. And a bull market. So that's a no-brainer. So the market goes up, so does the IPOs. One thing I've observed over the years is when the market begins to flatten out and people begin to lose interest, sometimes you'll see IPOs go up in spite of the market either going sideways or either, even going down sideways. It's like the IPO peaks after the market. Okay? And... Give me the signal. Uh, what's the, what's the symbol on that one, Susan? And we'll look at that in a second. So it's like you get that IPO peak that'll happen right after the market. Now, just like everything works in a bull market, other than shorting, nothing works in a bear market other than shorting. Okay. So if we do get into a bona fide downtrend here, even these IPOs will go down. So part of the problem that we could be faced with IPOs is that the overall market has begun to roll over and we enter into a, God forbid, a bear phase, okay? Susan says Alibaba IPO may put top in. Yeah, because, um, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, it's not trading yet. Um but yeah, that's like the, that sounds like the mother of all speculation. It's a Chinese stock, so we got we got into an interesting debate. I wouldn't call it a heated debate, but an interesting debate last week about one gentleman said he'd never buy a Chinese stock because they're all BS in their earnings or whatever they're reporting. They, they lie. So what? Who cares? They go up, you buy them. They go down, you sell them. Okay. Write that down. Write that down. There's your aha moment, right? If they go up, you buy them. If they go down, you sell them. Okay. Now, again, there's still a few winners, and all you need is a few winners, okay? We just talked about Zen, okay? And so far, Zen is still our friend, okay? Did you all notice that I, I threw a little, threw some song lyrics into the, uh, the, you know, it's kind of ironic in that song, they actually mentioned Dave. You guys are like, what the hell is he talking about? Let me see if I can find it. Well, what a waste of time, huh? <laughs> Days on sale again. <laughs> Try to see it once my way. Anyway, getting back to the Zen. So that was an IPO. And it's up 20% so far. And hopefully so far is a key word in that sentence. And hopefully um, we'll come back. I know Jonathan doesn't like to annualize things, but we'll come back. And this annualized will be a real number. We'll have 113% over six months. And then, of course, what am I going to do? I'm like, I'm going to say, hey, Jonathan, that's 226% annualized. Of course, I'm going to have to throw that uh, <laughs> out there. But, hey, look at this. 20% move. Not bad. Better than poking the iron. And hopefully, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully it will continue to run. Now, admittedly, I do not have a signal that would have triggered into this pattern unless you would have gotten in maybe yesterday but at that point I would even let this one go but this is loco polo what was it what was the um oh, poco loco no what's the uh, chicken brothers what was the chicken brothers restaurant in breaking bad I actually have that I actually have that t-shirt um this kind of reminds me of it this is like local chicken company or something a crazy chicken company and so a chicken company goes up a hundred percent so I'm not. I'm gonna. I'm gonna call this the uh, Los Pollos Hermanos. I hope I said that right. Um, is the chicken company. So here's a crazy chicken company going up 100 percent, and then and the symbol, ironically, is loco, which I think is crazy in um, in Spanish. Okay, pazzo is uh, Italian, but uh, I don't know what. Lo I think loco is crazy. So you got a crazy chicken company. And it's going up 100%, right? 
Okay, so this tells me that the this is the this is the the IPO market is entering the Monty Python phase. M O N T Y Python P Y. Okay, it's not dead yet. Okay. But it might be dying a little bit, okay? But it's not dead yet. And I'm going to schedule that um, webinar, and we're going to talk a lot about this. Here's just another example. The tour continues. This was a buy signal back in June, and so far it's more than double, double and a half, which would be a quadruple, which would be 500% annualized, Jonathan. Now we're picking on Jonathan. All right, name the next big winner, okay? I don't know. Name the next big winner in IPOs. You want me to name the next big winner in IPOs? Okay. Uh, we showed this graphic last week. Um, my friend and client, Sharon, gave this to us. Uh, it came from the Wall Street Journal. Um, and there's the sources down here, and this gentleman here wrote about it. We did have this peak, all-time peak for the year, and the number of IPOs coming public. That makes a lot of sense. One thing we did talk about in the webinar is that elf, that IPOs are self-policing or self-regulating in that no fool, no idiot, whatever, if the market's doing this going straight down, you're not going to be stupid enough to bring your company public because guess what? It's probably going to go straight down with the overall market. That sinking tide is going to sink all moats. So when are you going to bring your company public? When it's hitting all-time highs. Well, keep in mind that you can't just say, now, I want to bring it public. There's a lot of stuff that has to go on behind the scenes for you to get that company public. So the market looks like this, and by the time you get out with that, by the time everybody rushes to the door at the same time to get their IPOs out, what happens? Well, the market has already begun to roll over, and it might be too late. So this is one of the things. This plus the um, Druckenmiller thing, okay? But here's the deal. Even if it is over, just never forget about the tree thing, okay? This is knowledge, and knowledge is useful. And knowledge is going to be incredibly useful in the future, okay? So the next time a great hot IPO comes along, you'll know how to trade it. Even if it's even if you don't you're not in a rip roaring IPO bubble. Okay? Or let's say a bubble comes on, along again, and there will be bubbles, trust me on that. In individual issues, in individual markets, and in commodities, and all kinds of other different things. Okay, there will be bubbles. And there will be bubbles in IPOs. So the tree thing I was talking about was the best time to plant a tree is twenty years ago, and the second best time is to Day. I've got some acreage out here that I live on. It's it's nice. I live in the country, um, and it's amazing. It's like some of these trees we planted years and years ago, just little sticks, and are just huge now. They, this uh, neighbor across the street um, can't see his house anymore. Somebody uh, he went to sell it like ten years ago or fifteen years ago, and the agent says you don't have enough trees, so he planted a bunch of little stupid little seedlings on his property. I'm like, what an idiot. It's like, not enough trees. It's like, it's going to take 10 years for those trees to grow. Well, guess what? 10 years have passed. He's got huge trees on his property. So it's like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> you know, what's he going to do? It's like, oh, well, I have no tree. And now, ironically, he's trying to sell his house again. I guess he didn't sell it back then, and he decides to put it back in the market 10 years later. Guess what? He's got some really nice trees. Anyway, so my point is, in the future, so the best time you want to learn today so you're ready in the future. And hopefully, to me, that just makes all the sense in the world. Hopefully, it makes a lot of sense, you guys. Okay. If they don't go up, don't buy them. That's right. That's right, Howard. Were you at the, would you, there was a, I talked about Will Rogers being a good IPO trader. He would have been an excellent IPO trader because that's right. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Okay, there's a little bit too more to it than that, and that's why I spent, oh, I don't know, how many hours so far? Six hours in the webinar, and we got four more hours to go. Okay, plus I'm talking about them now, so if you add all that up, that's a lot of time. There's a little bit more to it than that, but for the most part, if you get that, you got it. Okay, um, John, we'll get to that question in just a few minutes. Uh, once again, you go to my website, the store is open. Um, I was told that the, the current trend is to put uh, nice big buttons, clean up everything. I was told that my website was a mess. 
So I've cleaned it up. You just got a few little buttons to click on up here. The store is right here, and then I was told that the, the current trend is nice big buttons telling you where to go and what is offered. And if you go right here, there's the IPO webinar I talked about. Right here is the stock selection webinar, and these are some of the IPOs that were at some of the stocks that came out of the webinar from, from the stock picking webinar, which inspired me to do the IPO webinar. Anyway. I digress, but that information is all there, so check that out if you get a chance. Uh, the other thing that I have available now is the archives for the first half of the year of the week in charts. So that's up until uh, end of June, and then I threw in an extra one in there. When I started putting together this slide here, or whatever you want to call this page, a splash page, um, I was amazing how I was amazed at how much stuff we covered. We covered a lot of stuff, so it's about 40 hours of information. So check that out if you get a chance. And this is how um, my go-to webinar software. I think is three or four thousand a year. This is how we pay for these these webinars. Okay, in case you're wondering. <laughs> okay, now let's get back to. Let's wrap up these slides so we can hop into the markets. That's what I want to do. That's my favorite thing to do. Um, anyway, so check out the store. Check out the first volume for uh, 2014. And it's amazing. I get emails all, every day asking me all these questions. Okay? And it's amazing. You know, should I change systems? Yes, it's there. It's in there, you know. Uh, following my plan. Shorting. Well, you know, shorting is a pain. Yes, it is. Dead money. We just talked about dead money yet again. Okay, but there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff. I was just amazing how much stuff was covered. I went in and skimmed through all these when I processed them. Anyway, that's there. Everything else is store. You can check it out. Right now, I'm running a special. Uh, I haven't decided how long I'm going to run it, but I'm kind of basically giving everything away for one price. If you get the stock selection webinar, you get a year to my trading service, and then you get the IPO webinar. I'm probably gonna. I'll. I need to come up with an end date for that, but right now I'm running that special for now. Okay, let's hop out into the um, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not gonna uh, yeah, I'll, I'll write that down, but I'm not gonna change systems Frenchie, I appreciate that I'm not gonna change systems midstream though and here's the other thing too, I'm actually grandfathered in with um, go to webinar, so even though I'm only paying a couple thousand or three thousand dollars or whatever, or yeah, only I know um, it would be a lot more than that if I were just uh, setting up my account. So uh, yeah, I appreciate that. But I'm there's no I'm so happy. I love go to webinar. I'm so happy with it. I'm not uh, I'm not gonna quit. So me and software, you gotta pry it from my cold dead hands um, for me to change. All right, let me get this chart set up here. If you just uh, give me a few minutes, I'll go through the markets and then we'll come back and talk about the. Um, We'll talk about the individual stocks. In fact, if you want to start asking about individual stocks right now, that's fine. You know, go ahead and hop into the. Uh, let me get the markets banged out real quick, and then we'll do that. All right, good, good questions. All right, let me fix this chart. It's amazing. I'm I'm awesome when um, when I'm not under pressure to perform as far as running the software. Oh, hallelujah. Finally got it. All right. Let's um let's take a look at the overall market. And then let's um let's work our way out to uh the individual stocks. Okay. Now the acid peas they kind of they're kind of running up here a little bit, and then you can see that they sort of went sideways for a while, and now they're sort of kind of rolling over. And when you see action like that, especially going back a few weeks, the first thing I want to do when I see that, I always plot a blank chart first, okay? But when I see a market start to go sideways, the next thing I want to do is put the moving averages in. And in this particular case, they weren't a whole lot of help because they really didn't roll over because the market was actually making new highs. 
not that long ago, okay? But we did see this sharp drop well below the moving averages, and then all of a sudden the moving averages played catch up real quick, and then you've got pretty much a textbook bow tie signal here, okay? Now notice that this high here occurred, this higher high and higher low occurred before the bow tie, so that's an actual first thrust type of setup. Let me draw that in for you. And then you have the bow tie that follows it. So all-time highs, thrust down, and then your little bit of a retrace in here, okay? That's your first thrust, which would have triggered, triggered a couple days ago. And then now you got a bow tie. you got a higher high and a higher low, so now you got a bow tie setting up, provided it doesn't trigger today. Then you're going to wait for a higher high and a higher low. Um, as I said earlier, if all you did was watch out for these hourly changes off of all-time highs and all-time lows, you wouldn't have much action, but when you did, it probably would work out pretty good. So look at the bow tie here, the hourly bow tie off of all-time highs, okay? And this right here is an all-time high, okay? You see a few in between that aren't off all-time highs. But as a general statement, it should work pretty good. And then if a market is going to start on a daily chart, it's going to start first on an hourly chart. But you've got to be really careful, though. If you look at these hourly charts, it's going to look like the end of the world. And sometimes it might just be a pullback or a correction, okay? But it's kind of interesting that that set up a few weeks ago on the hourly chart. Just people ask me about hourly charts all the time, so I thought I would throw that out. Patterns are fractal. Now, one thing you got to remember, take a look at like a weekly chart. On a weekly chart, it looks just like a pullback. Everything is fine in the world. And that's why I like the daily, because it's kind of like the Goldilocks. It's right in between where you're not going to get sucked in as much to a minor correction on a daily chart. But if it does begin to turn, you're going to be in long before something like the weekly. Okay, But if you start looking at those intraday charts too much, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble really fast. But I do, I do think it's worthwhile to take a peek at like an hourly bow tie if a market is coming off of all-time highs. Okay, So write that down. That's, that's good stuff. Okay, uh, S&P is looking pretty bad here, uh, a bit of a downtrend, as you can see, and a bow tie, et cetera. Uh, if you back the chart out a little bit, your next support is going to be right around here, which would be the top of this range, and guess what? That's, go that's going to be, without even plotting, I can tell you right now, it's going to be 200 moving average. There you go. Okay? And that's something that's kind of cool, is a lot of times, a lot of technicals come together right around the same point, so whether or not you believe or use certain technicals, a lot of times they're all going to come together at the same point, okay? All roads, is it all roads lead to Rome? Where do all roads lead to? Is it Egypt or Rome? Rome, I forget. Anyway, you can see the top of this range or thereabouts is going to be support, and that's going to be the 200-day moving average when we get there, okay? And we used to always joke, it's like the thermos. How do it know? It keeps the hot things hot and the cold things cold, okay? Uh, NASDAQ has a ways to go to get to its 200-day moving average, okay? Um, on a relative strength basis, kind of hanging in there. You can't live off of a relative basis, though. If the market goes down 50% and you only go down 40%, how are you going to eat, okay? How are you going to eat? <laughs> um, so I wouldn't get too excited that's hanging in there on a relative basis, but it does look like it could be in the early phases of being in trouble. Uh, when in doubt, uh, throw your moving averages in to give you a little guidance. And you can see that we have a little daylight below our moving averages, meaning the, meaning the highs are less than the moving averages. Moving averages are coming together. By the way, this would be a minor buy signal back here, okay? Minor because this isn't an all-time low or even a 10-year low or a 5-year low or even a 1-year low, okay? This right here is going to be a, a major sell signal should it materialize, okay? Now, right here, you had a sell signal, didn't trigger, went back up. You had a sell signal, you made a little bit, or could have made a little bit, I should say. You ignore the buy signal here because it's mid-range. And then if you have another sell signal here, it could be that second or third time is a charm thing that we just talked about. Okay? Does it bother you that everyone is looking at the same level? Ah, uh, in the P's? No, because what will happen, the markets, markets are... Markets are kind of fickle, um, really fickle, I guess I should say. Let me show you something here. No, I don't. 
and I don't know that it, it, until now I didn't know that everyone was looking at the same level. So thank you, Susan. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I know what you're saying. Um, you know, it's like uh, I remember a while back. I thought I was the only one in the world back when I was a little. My head was much bigger. The, trust me, the market has uh, shrunk in my head over the years. Uh, but I thought I was the only one in the world that um, saw a um, head and shoulders top in the market. And then somebody's like, Dave, Art Cashin on CNBC just pointed out a head and shoulders top. I'm like, oh, so the whole world knows it. Here's the thing, though, with technical analysis. Let's say my favorite example is like a double top. Okay, you got a peak in the market. Well, everybody and their brothers look at that prior peak. Well, what's going to happen is usually, let's say two out of three times, the market's going to stall well short of that double top and roll over. Okay, or it's going to come up and blast through that double top, and give everybody the all clear, and make everybody think, oh, all's great in the world, and then it'll roll over. Okay, so. It rarely pans out in that textbook kind of double top or double bottom fashion. So if you know there is some sort of, I guess the word leeway for lack of a better term, then what's going to probably happen with that support because everybody knows that. It's kind of like the Geico commercials. You know, everybody knows that Pinocchio is a bad motivational speaker. You know, I see potential in you and you. And so everybody knows that. But what will happen is the market is going to stall short of that support and fake people out, or it's going to bust through that support, okay? So it, we're not going to use that as a target to where when it gets hit, we're going to take off all our positions, or if it, if it gets approached and reverses, we're going to take off all our positions. We're just looking at it to give us a little bit of reference to where this market could possibly go. And that's just going to be the first level of support. We're not actually going to trade off this. So the answer is no, it doesn't bother me. And I also know that markets will do some crazy things and will rarely do the um, exact thing that technical an technical analysts, um, technical analysis, I should say, uh, would suggest. Now let's get back to the charts. But yeah, it, it'll probably. Um, It'll probably start stop, stop short of that, and everybody will think, okay, that's the bottom, and then it'll bust through it or do something uh, perverse, for the lack of a better word. Markets often do what they have to do to cause the most pain to the most people, and um, that's, a, that's an old adage that I stole from Linda Raskin that she picked up from somebody else on the floor when I asked her, um, in case you're wondering, just to give her credit, what credit is due. Um, the Russell, we kind of beat the dead horse in the Russell already. It's not a route, but it's been a pretty serious slide. And years ago, there were trading systems, and um, I'm not a big fan of mechanical systems, but I know there were trading systems that all they did was they would short like the NASDAQ when it went down 8%, okay, from a new high. I, I don't know if they had a new high. Or not. I think it was a new high was in there. Anyway, if that's the case, then that would be a signal here because – uh, at least on a closing basis, you dropped almost eight percent in the Russell. Okay, seven seventy-eight, close enough for government work. So the Russell's already been in a pretty serious slide. That's almost eight percent slide. Eight to ten percent in an index is a big deal. Okay, that's a big deal. When, especially something like the Russell, that means that most stocks have gone down around eight percent or so. And that's a pretty big deal over a fairly short period of time. Steven says, do you think the Russell 2K is more important relative to the tradable universe than the S&P 500? Uh, yes. As a general statement, I say yes. So what Steven is saying is I've got a tradable universe, which is 250,000 thereabouts or more average volume stocks. And in general, we're trading the – I like to trade the stocks somewhere around a half – somewhere around maybe a half a million uh, on average shares a day. I like those somewhat smaller cap issues within reason. And uh, the question is, is the Russell better in indicator of that? Absolutely. I'm a big fan of the Russell. Uh, if you look at the S&P 500, okay, let's just, I'll just throw the spiders real quick. Okay. What have they done? They've kind of made a base and they've kind of broken down out of the base and now they look poised to make a new leg lower. If you look at energies, what did energies do? Well, they kind of made a base. They broke down out of the base, and now they look poised to make a new leg lower. 
what has chemicals done? Well, it made a base, it broke down another base, and now it looks like it's big and do leg lower. So all these big, thick areas sort of look like the S&P themselves. So I agree with you, Steve, and I think this, that the um, the Russell is a much better index for what's really going on within the market. Because a lot of times I'll see the P's will be up a little bit, NASDAQ's up a little bit, and I'll go through all my stocks and go like, well, geez, you know, NASDAQ was up, P's were up a little, and I go through my tradable universe, and I'm like, these things got whacked. And then I'll look at the Rusty and say, oh, Russell was down three-quarter percent or a percent on a day. It's like, aha, that makes sense. That confirms what I'm seeing empirically. By the way, I was going to do, when I woke up this morning, I was thinking, or like, late last night at least, I was thinking my show today would be on empirical research by looking at all these different sectors and looking at all these different charts. And then I realized I did that show last week, which is kind of cool because the market has since um, rolled over a little bit since then, and all the signs were there last week. So I ended up taking all those slides out, uh, but go in and watch last week's show if you get a chance and check that out. Um, I might not have, uh, and on, they lead to Dave's house, Don. <laughs> All roads lead to jazz. All right. Use the new name for the bow tie. Oh, did I not say the new name? Uh, what is it? I already forgot. Big Dave's bow tie? What did I call it? Shoot. I already forgot. should have wrote that down. I'll call it Big Dave's bow tie. All right. Chemicals has a Big Dave's bow tie in it. Okay. i got to get used to saying it. It's a little sloppy once you're zooming in. Okay, and you can see Nasdaq's on the cusp. So most of the sectors, I'm not going to bore you too much with the sectors. What I found kind of interesting is on a day like yesterday, and this, this doesn't have today's data, and I forgot to update before I got started. But on a day like yesterday, you had some areas, even though the market was flat, you had some areas continue to implode in here. And the other thing I noticed yesterday that I was telling my peeps in the services, some of these areas that kind of, have hung in there like telecom are now getting hit. So it's kind of like the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Okay. Can you repeat the phrase you said about hourly bow ties off of all-time highs? Those are hourly big day bow ties off of all-time highs, okay? Uh, the point I was trying to make is that if a market is going to turn, it's going to turn on the hourly first. So when a market makes all-time highs, and and just you got to be careful with this because you can get a little caught up in the minutia sometimes. But if it's making all-time highs and it's not continuing to make all-time highs, then what you want to do is you just want to take a peek at the hourly bow ties to see what's going on. Okay, so. If you're, I think it's going to lose my screen if I do this. Let's do this. Let's get it back. So if a market's doing this and it's banging out new highs, okay, don't don't worry about looking at an hourly chart. Okay, this is a daily. Okay, but if it starts kind of meandering, going sideways, then take a peek at your hourly chart just to see what's happening internally. And it becomes one more clue. Now, you got to be careful because you might end up chasing your own tail. But if it's off of all-time highs, where your all-time high is right there, okay, and then you get a, let's say it right, a Big Dave's bow tie, okay, <laughs> then that could often be uh, the mother of all signals. It starts on the hourly, and then a little while later you get it on a daily, and then now we're, now we're beginning to get it on a daily. And you know what's next? Possibly the weekly. Okay, now we just spent a lot of time talking about the weekly bow ties, right? And we know what happens then. Bam, bam, bam. Sound like Emerald. Bam, okay? Now, all right, let's, um, let's get to some of these individual uh, stocks. CNX, I like that one. That's an aluminum stock. I want to pull back, okay? Uh, it, you know, I wanted to see it pull back a little bit more back here, and I guess I was waiting for perfection, and it's since taken off. So it's going to have to have another pullback. The only problem is we're now into a market where it's getting a little less and less is working, okay? And that's why I kind of...
talked a little bit about IPOs lately, but less and less is working. Just like I said earlier, everything works in a bull market. Well, everything doesn't work in a bear market, okay? So that's where we're kind of getting that less and less work. And so if you, if you drill down to aluminum, and you start looking at aluminum stocks, well, you can see that Alcoa has lost a little bit of esteem. Still looks like a pullback, but too many days. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifty. You got three weeks of sideways to lower trading now, okay? This is a Chinese aluminum stock. It's kind of hard to analyze that. You got this one still in an uptrend. But take a look at this one, CSTM. Now you got a bona fide sell signal in an aluminum coming off of all time highs. You got a big day's bow tie here, okay? So there's your short setup right there, okay? A little one to think. Did I just say my cage slipped out? I said there, right there, okay? Thank you, Steve. Steve says, great show. I appreciate it. I really, you know what? It warms my heart. I'm glad, I'm glad you're happy. I mean, that's why I'm doing these things, because it, um, because I hope I hope to reach some people and hope to help some people. I got a tear in my eyes. Oh, I digress. Anyway, we got a big day's bow tie here coming down. So within aluminium, this CSTM could be the bigger they are, the harder they fall. I don't know if it's borrowable, but put that one on your radar. Okay. So most of these stocks still look pretty good in here for the most part. This is a real thin one. Let's not worry about that. But then you got this one. This could be your canary in the coal mine. Okay, beginning to break down. So I would be cautious about getting along anything at this juncture. WLB, if you don't mind, um, my eyes are, 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 are leaving me. Uh, put your caps lock on when you ask for a symbol. It's, it's easy for me to read them. I know I'm getting old. Um, I'm guessing you're asking, uh, you're either asking about WLB or WIB. WLB looks like it's losing steam. It's the first thing I'm seeing here. It's beginning to roll over. Um, remember, you want stocks to accelerate higher and not decelerate higher. I mean, it looked like it was taken off here, but now it's beginning to roll over. And, James, you were in the stock selection webinar. Go into that and watch the part where we talk about losing uh, momentum, okay? G-P-R-E, G-P-R-E. Uh, yeah, maybe on a pullback, but, you know. James, give me stocks that are set up, okay? Uh, yeah, it's trending, and it should be on your momentum list, and it's probably on my momentum list. Let me see. Landry 100, GP, right, right here, Green Partners. Okay, when did we put that in? Watch this tracking. You know, this number here, number of winners was like 80 and 90% in here, and now it's, it's like 50-50. Just watching that number right there is a good uh, thing. One day I'm going to, I should probably do a whole webinar just on maintaining momentum lists because there's so much to be learned by doing this. I would recommend to those that that have time, come into here and uh, and maintain a momentum list every day. Uh, GPRE, no, GPRE hadn't been in that long, but hey, annualized, look at that, Jonathan. Annualized, it's already up 5% annualized. That's an 80% move. <laughs> Let's see if we've got any big annualized moves in here. Oop. We're not going to look at the negative side ones. There we go. 200% bidder. CNX, we just talked about that one. See this? 300% move annualized. Been in the 37 days. 40% move. Okay. All right. PLNR. It's on. Jeez. I'm going to have to ask you again. It's Andre or. Oh. P-L-N-R. I think it's Andre. Okay. The only problem with this one is, and we talked about this in the stock selection webinar, um, with IPOs, it's not too bad. But with individual issues, sometimes you have a bit of what I call a bottle rocket. And a bottle rocket, to those of you who aren't a redneck uh, and live in the country, <laughs> but if you live in the country, you're a redneck like me, you've probably played with some fireworks. And the bottle rocket's like... You know, it's, it's just like it's going to take off and go to the moon, but then it fizzes out really quick. And this is what it kind of looks like to me. This stock is just going straight up over a couple of days, two, three days, and then now it's beginning to pull back. So let's let it pull back a little bit and see what happens. The only other problem is this thing is super-duper thin, okay? So be careful on that one, too, 
Okay, but um, I would let it go just because it's it's going straight up in a bottle rocket kind of fashion. SAFM is a short. Yeah, I'm gonna like that one because that's a that's a food company, and foods have been um, headed lower. SAFM. Here we go. Yeah, that's beautiful. Is that in the landry list? It should be if it's not. But the reason it didn't make it, if it didn't, is because it's thin. Um, but yeah, it's beautiful. It's already triggered though. You see, you got a nice little trigger there. And then you also have a Big Dave's bow tie right here. Thank you guys for helping me name that. I appreciate that. You may have just you may have just launched my new career. <laughs> Big Dave's bow tie. SLCA. SLCA. Uh, you, no. Okay, because it, it's, if you look at, yeah, it just kind of went, it, it kind of got above this little base and it came back to it. Um, it looks like it's losing momentum. It's kind of hard to see with the naked eye. So let me see if I can find a way to show you how it's losing momentum. Um, well, I guess it just, it just kind of barely got past all this congestion in here. Shot up, came all the way back to it. To me, it just looks like a stock that's losing momentum. Um, now, if it goes on to make new highs, maybe on a pullback. Okay. John wants to know about NXPI. Hey, John, welcome aboard. Good to see you. Um, no, it's a stock that's lost momentum. Um, if anything, it might almost be a short. In fact, you see, th this is kind of a good teaching lesson here. Uh, if you're just looking at this stock by itself, it just kind of looks a little sideways, okay? But when you put in a Big Dave's bow tie, you could say it's kind of hard to say. Do I have to say that every time if I want to get credit? Yeah, okay. Uh, if you put in a Big Dave's bow tie, you can see it has bow tie down and looks like it could be in trouble. Um, I wouldn't jump all over this one just yet because it does. It looks like it would probably come back to the support down in here. But, yeah, it is a stock that looks like it's, uh, it's in trouble. I'm bearish on the semiconductors. I have a position in Micron on the short side, um, and I did recommend it to my clients. Uh, look at that. There you go. We got a big day's bow tie in the works, and uh, stock looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Still time to short it. FYI. Don's here. Guess what he wants to know about? Ford. Well, Ford could make a big day's bow tie down soon, so we could hit the mother of all sell signals in Ford. Not off of all-time highs, a long ways away from all-time highs, but off multi-year highs. So it could be a decent signal in Ford. So, Don, um, for once, Ford looks like it's okay, and the fact that it might actually do something. It might actually head lower. Uh, I'm not a big fan of trading big, thick stocks, okay? I proceed to go up. Yeah, Martin. Martin's putting a little salt in the wounds, saying that uh, we were in a stock and then went up. We're short the stock too, I think. <laughs> I don't know. My memory's fading with these things. Just so you know, it's just it, it should your memory should fade too, okay? He's got a little sad face uh after his what do you call it? Emoticon? He's got a little emoticon after his uh it went up. It's like, well, I try to forget about stocks the second that gets stopped out and move on and look at the next stock. And I'm like, Where were we in this stock? You know. <laughs> I don't know, I don't remember. I just it it's you have to be antiseptic. You rip it off like a Band-Aid, forget about it, move on, find another one, okay? Yeah, CMCM looks pretty good. That's an IPO. And it did, it, one of the things I was looking, you see it already got drawn in here. Uh, one thing I've been looking at with these IPOs is you do get, sometimes you do get a big, deep retracement. That was one of the patterns that we went into. And uh, this one has, it has, has done, is that the correct word? I don't think so. That sounds Cajun. <laughs> Yeah, this one has done a pullback two times on a deep retracement. Um, no, it um, yeah, it's kind of had a deep retracement. If your first deep retracement is is a pattern that we were looking at at the IPOs as a possible tradable pattern, and it has uh, certainly done that. So so far so good. But you're gonna have to wait for the next uh, setup on that one, John. RVM is that one of those reverse things? RVM. Oh, it's RWM. I'm thinking about. It. Uh, too thin, okay. Um, kind of wide and loose. Let's zoom in a little bit. Well, it really didn't clear this prior peak by much. I hear you, though. Who said that? Um, the new guy? 
I hear you though. It, it's it's headed up. It's pulled back. It looks okay. Super thin. It didn't really clear this peak by much. It does have some bad memories, but it, it's not that bad. Okay. It's not that bad. Cores, this ain't too bad. Uh, yeah, this one's this one's kind of all over the place. That's my only problem with cores. Uh, but now it looks like it's in bona fide trouble. Uh, I can't really argue with you on it. I think it's yeah yeah it's definitely in trouble. It's almost like everybody knows that though. <laughs> it's kind of like a Pinocchio trade. But I can't argue with you. I mean, it's headed lower. It's pulled back. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. I'm not going to high-five you, though, because it's, it's like second or third stage. But it, it's still in a lot of trouble. I have to agree with you on that. Susan wants to know about EGO. Or oh, she's telling me I have an ego. Um, yeah, you know, these goals really disappointed me because I thought they were off to the races. Uh, on the next pullback, if you're long, you definitely want to stay long. That's a good-looking stock. We were looking at this one. A few weeks back, and I'll show you the setup we had. We had a, a pullback in here. We were looking at this one a few weeks back, and it never really materialized, but now it looks like it's beginning to uh, take off. So, yeah, on the next pullback, I think that one is a, certainly a viable setup. Alan says BLDB in case you didn't get to that one. BLDB. That's going to be like Ballard or something. BLDB. B L D B. It's not coming up. B D. What would be the B D L B? Okay, uh, it's yeah. I, I know which one you're talking about, but I can't think of the symbol, Alan. So if you can give me the, the new symbol, the correct symbol. James wants to know about Arjun as a short. James, you are dusting off your short and uh, short and hat. Okay, a couple things jump out at me before we look at the chart. First of all, it's a little on the thin side, okay, for shorts. Um, you could get a little crazy on the long side, and we do get we do get a little crazy, especially in the IPOs on the long side, because some of those IPOs are thinner. Um, but on the short side, you want to make sure something that's fairly thick, okay. I would use at least a half a million on average volume. Here we have almost a half a million so you might be able to short the only other thing that scares me though is it's biotech and it's a little bit thinner biotech okay if it's something like a Gilead or however you say it then you got a big thick biotech and they might come up with a cure for something but it's such a huge company that's not going to make it that big of a difference in the chart but something like Arjun here, if they if they come up with a cure for Ebola, even though it's not going to make that much money because there's not that much Ebola in the world, thank thank God, by the way. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, like Gilead, it's not going to go up that much. But if this little company discovers that a cure for Ebola, it's going to. Somebody asked me last week, Dave, what do you do if if you're short if short of biotech goes up three hundred percent? Are you responsible for that three hundred percent loss? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Of course you are, you know. Well, what if you only have five grand in your account? Well, number one, you should be shorting it. You should be shorting anything if only you have the five grand in your account. You probably shouldn't be trading unless you're nibbling at things and learning how to trade, which is fine. Buying one or two options contracts, buying maybe a little IPO and, and just testing the water. But knowing that that money you're trading could turn into tuition, turn into tuition, meaning that you could end up losing that money if you try to trade a small account like that. Anyway, I digress. So. What it scares me is I'd be nervous about shorting this stock because it could, let's say, something good could happen for the company. This thing could go up substantially. Now, let's take a look at what we got, what we have. You almost have a big day's bow tie, bow tie working, and then you do have a bit of a thrust down. You do have, and this is something that's jumping out at me, you have a bit of an inverted cup and handle. Let me see if I can draw that. The drawing tools are less than desirable in this thing, but... You've got that, you've got that, you got that, and you got that. You see it now, okay? You got an inverted cup and handle pattern working. So that's something. Uh, so 
do I think this is do I think this is a good pick? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. <laughs> Would I trade the stock? Probably not, because it is a biotech. It is fairly volatile, not extremely volatile, but fairly volatile. Okay. Now, like I said, if it's something like a Gilead, let's just take a look at Gilead because we talk about it so much. Something like a Gilead trades about a bazillion, bazillion, million, trillion, zillion shares a day. It might be worth a shot of going after it. Okay. I think my volume is 30-day average. It's right here. Let me see if we can figure out what that, that is. Uh, edit field. Uh, it's 50-day average. But I use 30. 30 or 50. Don't get caught up. It, it, it doesn't really matter. 30 days is plenty enough. 50 days is, is even better or, or just the same. But this is 50-day volume. I think all my scans start by 30-day volume. You want my scans, just let me know. Susan wants to know about, I think that's Freeport McMoron. Let's see, FCX, FCX, FCX. Okay, yeah, it's Freeport McMoron copper. My problem, you know, only problem with uh, these commodities is they can be really choppy, as you know. Um, notice that it barely got past these past peaks, and now it's rolling back over. So I would leave that alone. I wouldn't short it. But I certainly wouldn't go long, Susan. Stay away from that for now. Uh, if you want to buy a metal, buy aluminium. But we talked about that quite a bit. That, that, that could have its problems, too. Let's try BLDB again. BLDB. Nope, still won't come up. BLDB. You sure you got the right symbol on that, Alan? LSG for Jonathan. G. I know LSG is a stock. There it is. Yeah, this is a little thin gold stock. Um, it's only like a buck a share, and it's only four hundred thousand. So you got to be really careful. This is something speculative. I have, I have personally traded the stock before. Okay, I mean we're private traders. We can go in and take a really, we can take a flyer and something like this. Um, now with that said, you want to see it bang out some new highs decisively, decisively, and then maybe look to trade the first pullback. Keep in mind, though, HV 115, this is what I'm pointing to right here. That's the historical volatility on a 50-day basis. That's extremely high, so it is a speculative stock. It's also a gold stock. Gold can chop around a lot. So be careful if you go after something bad. It's just a completely um, speculative. Susan's trying to guess at Allen's stock, BOKB. No, I don't. I, I think he's is – he, is he Ballard? It's either Ballard Medical Products or – it's that company that does some, something with energy I think he's looking for. Ballard Power Systems. That's what he's trying to do. BLDP. <laughs> well, what were you saying? Were you, were you writing it? Uh, he, was, he must have been writing it um, in uh, small caps. All right, come on. Who's, who's asking about this? I, Alan, you know better. This is just uh, no. Am I gonna, no. Where's Nicholas? Time to break out Nicholas. I thought we could make it through a whole show without Nicholas. Now I'm going to break him out. Where's where? Here he is. No. <laughs> this is for messing up. If you ever watch this skit, he just goes in there and, and he gives political commentaries and mostly he says no, and that's his commentary. So no, no, no. Uh, okay, so we've gone. And I could probably fiddle with this and change that a little bit, start date, end date, whatever. So in like, um, how long is that? Four months? It's going absolutely nowhere, completely sideways. So no. Now, if it breaks out of this base, maybe. I'm not a big fan of stocks. Uh, with this peak, it's a little too close right here. If this was further back, um but no, I think I would pass. I mean, that's there's nothing there for me. I don't see what you see, Alan. Poor Alan. After all that trouble. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to make you work so hard for it. Jerry wants to know about THRM. THRM. Uh, yeah, it's possible short. In fact, I should have checked my lander list. That is on my lander list for today. Um, but yeah, sh my apologies. Uh, but yeah, that's a possible short. Looks pretty good. Uh, first thrust down. 
Uh, a Dave Landry, no, no, I'm sorry, a Big Dave's bow tie in the works. So that looks pretty good. Okay, Arsene wants to know about X. Yeah, this is U.S. Steel, and this is kind of the was kind of the wild thing that's going on. This is a steel stock; it went up 20% overnight. Uh, my problem is it w did this, and now it's doing this. Okay, so I like to see stocks accelerate and not decelerate, and that's a problem when you have like a big one day move it's kind of like one and done especially with a big thick stock like this with a with a, a brick and mortar company like this i guess you would so to speak a mining company um they're not splitting the atom right they're not they're just digging in the ground and pulling out steel or, or they're processing the steel or something so um it's going to have to show me some acceleration but see it just popped out and that was it and then it just kind of drifted up if you're long stay long Jonathan wants to know about LME or LIME. I, I guess I meant to put my glasses on. LME, LME, you poor guys. Is it Lime? LIME, Lime. Well, it's up 156 percent today. Yeah, it looked like it was a pretty good buy yesterday. <laughs> No, uh, you no. Why would you? Why would you want to? You can't do anything with this. This was certainly not a buy yesterday. I was joking about that. Now it's up um, six hundred percent overnight. Three hundred percent. No, there's nothing to do with that. You tease me. All right, hey Dave, Lime uh, X. We did that. X Y. Oh, my, look at X. Might as well look at Y. And then I guess Z's next. Uh, yeah, it looks like a possible short. Uh, too thin. You're joking about X, Y, Z, right? All right, let's take a look at Z. Um, no, Z's pulled back. It's taken it off. It's pulled back to its prior pullback, so leave that alone. Okay. And he's just busted my chops, Jonathan. That's because I, pick, that's cause I picked on you about annualizing those uh, earnings, huh? <laughs> those, uh, what is it, losses. Thanks for hanging in there. All right, goes around, comes around. Yeah, on a pullback, HC, absolutely. Um, sure. Uh, or something good. Uh, good pick on that, but on a pullback. EGHT. We're gonna have to go to the lightning round. Just one second. Uh, no, you got too much overhead supply in this one. It's kind of all over the place. Uh, it gapped higher, but it really didn't clear this prior high. It's just, it's all over the place. You got too much overhead supply on that one. Okay. Plus, um, oh no problem, Alan. Thanks for letting me kind of uh, pick on you. Um, the other thing, too, remember that the market itself is kind of in trouble. Jerry, we just looked at that one. It looks like a possible short. This is Cummings for Mike. I, a, I think I tell a story every time somebody brings up Cummings. They, they used to have a different symbol, and it was um, slang for a dirty word. And a buddy of mine, he would, he would trade the stock just so he could – make jokes about it with his broker, you know, and then he also bought cat because his cat t told him to, um, and that was a joke, but it was just, he was a hot mess. He, he's the, uh, it, it, sometimes when I give these um, seminars, webinars or whatever, I talk about um, his claim to fame was, he's no longer with us, so we can talk about him. His claim to fame was that um, he turned about $5,000, which I later found out was uh, of highly questionable origin, into about a million bucks in uh, options. Unfortunately, he round-tripped it, and he showed up at my doorstep um, when he was homeless. But anyway, I digress. But, uh, yeah, that looks like a stock that's in trouble in here. Uh, it's had a pretty big break already, but, uh, yeah, I think that was in trouble, Mike. Uh, definitely in trouble. Um, and, you know, these big companies, these big, thick companies, I'm not a big fan of trading these lower volatility stocks, but I think that uh, – Susan knows. <laughs> Susan remembers that, huh? <laughs> I digress. Uh, anyway, yeah, you've been around long enough. I guess one day somebody went to work and said, you know, a symbol is kind of, um, it's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, well, I mean, I guess it's a good thing, but you know what I mean. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. Like they woke up one day like, oh, never, never mind. Um, yeah, that one looks like it's in trouble, all jokes aside. Uh, I do like some of these lower big cap stocks, lower volatility, higher volume big cap stocks, like MU, for instance, and that's the Micron is where he made his money in the options. Uh, I like Micron as a short uh, simply because it's, it's, it's a big, thick stock, 
volatility. It's, it's a little higher in volatility, but it's not too high. And then I think you could still get an expansion in volatility to the downside. Okay. So uh, Micron, I think, is a, a Big Dave's um, bow tie. Is that what we're calling them now? Big Dave's bow tie, not quite, but it was a first thrust. And it also had a gap in it, which is reversal gap strategy. If you get a gap after brand new highs. In fact, let's pick this one apart a little bit before we shut things down. Um, when you get brand new highs, everybody in the world is happy. But notice that right after the new highs, it had a gap down. So that right there tells you this stock could be in trouble, okay? And then you had this gap down here, and then you also have a first thrust down, okay? And it's not that far away from that trigger. So I still think it's a viable setup um, on the EMU, okay? All right, uh, I think we got everybody done today. Well, that's great, fantastic. We got all the questions answered. Okay, uh, software is a little hard to keep up after about an hour and a half. That's right about the time I need to shut things down. So let me go ahead and wrap things up. I love doing these shows. I have a blast. Thank you guys for letting me pick on you a little bit, and you picked on me a little bit too, so that's okay. Um, I learn from these shows, and I hope you learn as much as I do from them because I just love doing them. Um, any unanswered questions, David, Dave, Landry com. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk again, and then I hope to see uh, all you guys and uh, girls uh, here again next week. Thank you so much.